All right. There you go. Hello, Alex. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. Welcome to this episode of Vestibular Talks. Uh, we are going to uh, mix it up a little bit because I know your condition is not really a, a vestibular problem on its own, but it's uh, equally interesting and important for us to create awareness about uh, your condition. Yes, that sounds fantastic. Thank right. You uh, do, you mind, <laughs> do you mind sharing with us a little bit about you, your life, how old you are? Yeah, so um, my name is Alex. I live in South Carolina in the United States. Um, I am 21 years old and I have chronic migraine. Um, so it's a neurological disorder and I do experience some vestibular symptoms. So right now I'm currently on disability because of the severity and frequency of my migraine. So I'm not your average 21 year old college student. I used to be, but on a new life path now, just trying to explore healing and creating a lifestyle that really works for me and migraines and not letting the disability kind of control me. Great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Alex, your chronic migraines, when did they start? Um, so chronically, they started in high school, but I had symptoms going back even to elementary school. I remember in had to be fifth grade. I got moved in the classroom away from like the bright fluorescent lights right by the window because okay. I was having troubles reading. And so we got my eyes checked and they were fine, but I was still getting headaches. So that is kind of the starting point. I think eye strain and migraine was slowly starting to present, but it took all the way till high school to actually know that, oh, this is actually migraine. All right. And what was a regular day for Alex before the migraines became chronic? And what's a regular day for you now? Wow, before they became chronic, I was in high school. So I'd get up and we had our school started super early. I was on the bus at 5 a.m. Oh. or 6 a.m. Like it, we had to get there super early for classes to start, um, go through the day, regular academic stuff. I was really social, always hung out with friends, did all sorts of fun activities. I didn't participate in sports. I'd had a knee injury, but um, I went to a lot of sporting events and just kind of regular life as high school progressed. I, of course, had high school and work, so I was a very, very busy, active person. Now with migraines, um, once they got really, really bad, it was a constant battle of work and school and, oh, I have time off and I'm in debilitating pain. Now I, I don't really do a whole lot. I wake up around nine o'clock in the morning, drink my coffee, do some stretches, and I just slowly move through my day, um, eat three well-balanced meals, and I really focus on listening to my body. Some days I write, some days I paint, but it's really just a move with the flow type of experience these days. All right. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of your symptoms affect your vestibular uh, system. Uh, when, when you say that, that, I'm assuming it's probably dizziness, lightheadedness, maybe a little bit of vertigo, or what else do you experience? Um, that's kind of the most of it. I know some neck pain and tension can also be associated with vestibular. Yes. Um, that's probably one of my most severe is the neck pain and tension. Um, but aside from the actual physical head pain, the vertigo really gets me. That one is really... Like, I find a lot of afternoons, I can't get up. <laughs> I don't <laughs> try to. Um, and then it impacts me a lot at night if I'm having a bad pain time. If I have to get up to use the bathroom, I walk straight into the wall. <laughs> Quite wow. often. Yes, so that's, those are some of the vestibular symptoms that I experience. Okay. Your chronic symptoms, are they consistent throughout the day, every day, or some of them just come and go depending on the time of the day or anything like that? Yeah, so it varies a little bit. It's relatively consistent if we don't have some outside factors. So usually I wake up in the morning and I'm, I'm doing all right. Sometimes there's a little brain fog. Um, by mid-afternoon, I can sense some drowsiness and my pain will increase. And then 
in the evening, if it's going to be a bad pain day, I am down to the count, cannot do anything. Um, and occasionally, like eating dinner or taking a hot shower will help and I'll feel a bit better. But those are that's the most consistent. Um, if I do have days where it's more severe pain, I can wake up and be done for the day, unable to move kind of right off the bat. So that comes and goes, but it's pretty fairly consistent. OK, Alex, uh, for a 21 year old, a chronic condition like this is obviously, obviously like life changing. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm assuming there are many things that you would like to do with your friends that you are limited on doing. Um, so this has had an effect in your social life and mm -hmm. in your professional life as well. How are, how are you coping with that? What are you trying to do to keep yourself like positive and busy and, and trying to like just become better every day? Yeah, so I try to focus mainly on the fact that I'm so fortunate that this did happen when I was so young. I was studying to be an interior designer and I absolutely loved it and I loved the job I had but having to force myself to step back and say no to a career and no to school and 100% yes to my health has given me an opportunity to really figure out what I want to do with my life because I'm 21. Migraine yes. can't kill you. So there's endless opportunities that are available to me and I kind of get the opportunity to sit here and learn every single day about something new in this world that I could be passionate about. And so that kind of keeps me going on a day to day for what does the future look like? Because it, the future looks like whatever I want it to look like. I, yes. I get to figure it out. And that's really exciting. When it comes to my social life, I did relocate back across the country. I had been living in Wisconsin during college. And so I moved back home, moved back in with my parents and just, re just recently moved back into my own place. So kind of a lot of time is focused on me trying to learn how to cook again and how to take care of myself. But I do really only have one friend in the area and I'm so thankful for her. She also has migraine. So we see each other maybe once or twice a month, but it's so great because she's so understanding and she's just an incredible person really so i want to like extend my social life and meet more people and that's hard because i can't just go sit in a coffee shop i can't commit to plans but as i slowly get better and recognize what my limits are i'll be trying to make a few more friends but i am totally content with my best friend tori that i have right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad that sounds great um, Alex, when they were trying to diagnose you, what kind of testing did they do in order to find out that you had actual chronic migraines? Um, so right off the bat, they didn't do any initial testing. I was diagnosed with migraine, I believe, eighth grade or ninth grade, and they immediately put me on birth control and said, this is going to solve all your problems. Okay. They did not solve all my problems, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then... As I moved through high school, I had some additional tests as I started seeing a neurologist. They did some MRIs and some x-rays to really rule out any other problems that may be occurring. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, nothing showed up. There were no abnormalities on the tests. Um, recently, I've actually done some nutrient testing, so had all my like calcium and you know nutrients that your body needs, all those levels I had checked. And that was really to figure out if there is an imbalance causing some of the pain. Um, here I could take some supplements to try and address it, change some diet stuff. All those tests came back normal. So not an issue, but definitely something if you do suffer from migraines, get your nutrient levels tested. Because if you're deficient in something and a supplement can help you, it's, that's a really great way to address it quickly. Um, I've also had a fatigue panel to make sure that there may not be another condition like chronic fatigue playing a role, and that didn't show anything. Okay, have because uh, I know you're located in the United States, and uh, as you know, I'm in Canada. Yeah. Uh, our health systems might be similar, but also different in many ways. Mm -hmm. How were the doctors with you? Because you being young and and 
saying, hey, I'm having these symptoms and, and they are so hard to diagnose because as you said, an MRI wouldn't show mm -hmm. a, a migraine. An MRI would show like an aneurysm or a stroke or anything like that. Yeah. Were the doctors compassionate and caring with you? Or were they saying, oh, it's probably anxiety, you're young, you're probably stressing yourself out too much. How, how was the, the basically yeah. the, the procedure with the doctors? Yeah, so I've had kind of a mix of experiences. The neurologist I have now is the same doctor I had in high school, and he is absolutely fantastic, um, okay. very compassionate, and it he has the idea that I'm too happy to be sick, <laughs> and I know he is coming from a very genuine place of, I want to find the right treatment for you so you can be better and live your life because no one deserves to live like this. It's definitely a weird thing to say to a patient if you're too happy, but uh, but I've had some pretty rough experiences. The first neurologist I saw in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area, um, he was not willing to work with me. He did not care about anything I had to say or my wow. concerns for treatments. And so that was kind of disheartening. And then my regular primary care doctor that I had up there, when I presented the idea that I wanted to apply for disability and start that process, she told me I should just get an anxiety medication because dealing with work and a college degree and also having a chronic illness, there must be some anxiety there. And I moved home two weeks later and none of my other doctors have suggested it, but it, it's definitely one of those things where it depends on the doctor and I'm a very assertive person i walk in and i tell doctors exactly what i want good good yeah. sometimes you need to do um, that and i also will bring my parents with me to doctor's appointments if i feel like i'm not being heard or just to have another person there because if the brain fog kicks in while i'm trying to talk to a doctor i need someone there who can advocate on my behalf and know what it is that i want so that i can get that and oh. i fire doctors if a doctor is disrespectful to me, I will fire them and go get a new doctor because <laughs> I have that right. They work for me and I see so many patients who they go years without getting an actual diagnosis and that's, it breaks my heart. I, <laughs> I love how you said that you fire your doctor. That's, that's not something that people say often. So <laughs> They should. People should know that they can fire their doctors. <laughs> Getting in to see a specialist can take some time, but I've mostly fired more primary care doctors than specialists, but it you have to know that you're able to do that because you you deserve great health care. You just have to fight for it. Yes, and, and it's important that you said that you are very uh, basically confident and determined to get to, to show the doctors your point of view. Because many patients, like you said, go undiagnosed for many years or they go misdiagnosed because yeah. they are afraid to speak up. They just say to the doctor, oh, OK, oh, OK, I agree, whatever you're saying, even though that might not be what's best for them. So, mm -hmm. so that's great. I, I admire you for doing that. And, and hopefully more people get that that confidence that you have and they, they are able to do the same. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, uh, regarding medicines, what kind of medicines do you take for your for your migraines, for your headaches? What what has helped and what hasn't? Yeah, so I'm currently on um, a regimen of it's called Keppra. It is an anti seizure medicine. Um, wow, okay. I don't have seizures, but they also use this type of medicine in the treatment of migraine. Um, okay. This is the first medicine that I've had that has really done anything and i didn't know that until i went off the medication and experienced a huge increase in the intensity of the migraines it felt like i was having a constant stabbing pain through my head at all times and okay. in reintroducing the keppra that went away so the migraines will still get super severe but not as severe as i have experienced so that's the best that I've found. I was using a variety of abortive medications. Um, yes. Furacet had been my go-to. And this past spring, I quit all of my abortives. I realized that even if they helped for six hours or 12 hours, I was still 
back in the same amount of high intense pain within 24 to 36 hours. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop these. These medications are not serving me. About a year and a half ago, I had been diagnosed with medication overuse headache because I had I'd been taking one or two different types of abortives every single day because I was desperate for something to work. We fixed that. I stopped having medication overuse headache, but even in limiting the use of Furacet to like eight or nine times in a month, I was still experiencing a rebound from the medication. Uh -huh. So since I've stopped taking a medication for the pain in the moment, um, I've gotten rid of the rebound related headaches. Yep. So that's definitely good. Um, yeah. And obviously, don't like anyone watching this, don't just stop taking your medication. Talk to your doctor. Of course, um, of course. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> it's a process. But um, so that's, I'm currently just on the Keppra. I do take a calcium and vitamin D magnesium supplement, mm -hmm. and then I'm on birth control. So that's currently what I have, but I have been on just about every migraine medication that's out there. Um, I tried Amavig last fall, and I was not a match for that. I ended up bedridden because of the side effects from it, mm -hmm. and that's one of the new CGRP medications. So been through the ringer of all the medications and personally haven't found real success with them. Okay, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Alex, what about, I know some people get their migraines become worse depending on what they eat. Have mm -hmm. you implemented any dietary changes or basically you eat what you want? Like how, how does it work for you? Um, yeah, so in the last four or five years, I've done probably all the elimination diets that are out there suggested for people with migraines, people with inflammation, all that stuff. I tend to eat really healthy anyway. I've always been a cook at home kind of person. I don't okay. eat fast food. I don't really go to restaurants. I like fresh food. Um, but I just finished out this lifestyle program that is specific for migraines. And one of the focuses was identifying foods that we wouldn't normally think about as triggers. And one of the food groups was like tomatoes and like different types of peppers and stuff. And I was like, this is so odd. But so I tried it, um, realized that food does not have any impact on me. I did start using like a probiotic yogurt with granola. Okay, in the nice. Morning. Um, that has helped some of my digestive issues. Um, but I don't know how much of a connection that has to migraine. Our whole body's connected, so the connection's there. Just not sure what it is. Um, I, I tend to eat, like, I've shifted when I eat, so I don't eat until about 10 o'clock in the morning, even if I've been up for a while, okay. because it'll, I'll get really, really nauseous if I eat earlier. Um, and then I try to have a snack. I'll do some macadamia nuts and cranberries before bed, nice. and then I don't wake up with much pain. So there's something there with having some food in your stomach when you go to bed that contradicts all those diet guidelines. But as a migraine sufferer, that it, that has helped a bit, including that nightly snack. Okay. Uh, yeah, the reason why I asked you is because I've been trying to follow the migraine diet, oh. but it's, it's extremely restrictive. There, there oh, are so many... Awful. It's it's almost... You almost end up eating grass and water. <laughs> That's it. Like, there, there's... Yes. It is, it is like a medium. I absolutely struggle with it because one of my biggest symptoms had previously had been nausea and I would kind of stop eating. My body didn't want any food. And so with all these diets and stuff, I struggle to stay at a healthy weight. And over the last three months, I've lost five pounds that I don't have to lose. And so I kind of just made the firm decision of food is not my enemy. I am going to cook food. I'm going to love it. And I'm going to love my body. And it's great if people can identify if there are foods that are causing them pain. But there's a big push in the migraine community to focus on food. And I think that can be harmful because the idea that losing weight is a benefit is not it that's that's very damaging to a lot of perceptions so yes i, I agree with you and, and 
Yes, I agree. Some foods can be triggers, but th these diets almost make food become evil. Like people are yeah. so afraid now of eating yeah. because they are like, oh, that might give me a headache. That might give me a migraine. That might yeah. give me worse symptoms. So, so no, I agree with you 100%. Alex, um, this is going to be a difficult question, but um, you probably experienced it that um, you being young and being uh, having your whole life ahead of you and being in, in, in on disability, many people probably judge you. They probably, I mean, I don't know if this is your case, mm -hmm. but some people probably point the finger and saying, oh, maybe she just wants the easy way out. Maybe she just doesn't want to work. How, how do you deal with people like that that are not really compassionate or understanding about your condition? Yeah, so I can definitely say everything you just said has been thoughts that have run through my head um, a lot. And to address that specifically, so much of it is just in my head. Um, okay. There's Because we read, we constantly read about the people who do deal with not having supports or people making comments. And yeah. I internalize a lot of that. And so I've had to work really hard to change my thought process. Like I live in South Carolina. I can lay out and be in a ton of pain in beautiful beach palm trees. And it's like, and she's on disability. And it's like, yes, <laughs> yes, I am. But but no one's ever said, and she's on disability. I will say in the very beginning, um, I struggled with people who wanted to tell me how to fix myself. Mm. I struggled with the idea of people who said, I was just too smart to leave school, that my brain was worth more than being on disability. Mm -hmm. And to those people, I've just cut them out of my life. They are not worthy. And it's been family, it's been ex-teachers, it's been friends. They're simply not worthy of occupying any space in my life because I, I've taken a huge stride in sharing my information, making it publicly available in a way that you kind of have to be interested in it to find it. So if people don't want to make the steps to read my blog and read updates and they just want to say, oh, go see a chiropractor and, you know, not send me the money to go see a chiropractor, I, I don't have to entertain those people or be there for them in instances. So it's really just a matter of kind of protecting myself and choosing who I surround myself with, who wants to support me and is there for me when I need it. Okay. And thank you for talking about your blog. That was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you uh, the initiative after basically what motivated you to do this blog was what? To help other people? It, to was, no, it was actually exactly what we were just talking about. I um, December of 2017, maybe 2018, I, my health started getting to kind of the worst of it. It was sneaking up of, oh, do I have to drop out of school? How is this going to work? And I was posting on Facebook and I was sharing updates about how much pain I was in, the fact that, oh, I couldn't go to school again, or I had to call off work. And I was getting these awful responses from my family. And it okay. was like, one day it would be, oh, well, have you tried, and I'll, chiropractic is the example, have you tried chiropractic? It's really helped me, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, full-time student, full-time job, I don't have time. And three days later, they're like, well, have you tried chiropractic yet? And I was like, I don't have time. It's <laughs> <Like, that's laughs> not something that's an option for me. I appreciate your concern. And eventually some family just got kind of rude and was like, well, if money's an issue, we're going to send it to you. And I'm thinking they were doing it in a way to slam my parents and say that my parents weren't financially assisting me, which wasn't the case. My parents have been a huge help. And so I was talking to a great friend of mine. Her name is Samantha. And I was like, well, how do I deal with this? And she's like, Alex, the way you talk and the way you express things, she's like, you should have a blog. And I was like, I should have a blog. <laughs> and so I went <laughs> home and I made a blog in the spring of 2018. And it started off as a really dark, sad place where I was just sharing updates about pain and different doctor's appointments. And I slowly started having a shift as people were reading it. And People were reading it and I was shocked. And 
I realized how my experience could kind of help people understand what I was going through. And so the next few months just kind of was this transition period of sharing how I decided to stop working and then decided to move home. And then I did shut down my blog last November and decided I'm not, this no longer makes me happy because it used to be a therapeutic type of release. And then I realized I was at that point just making content to make content. And so I reopened my blog in December with the idea called my life, my migraine. I was like, I'm going to start sharing my life too not just my migraine. And so now it's become an incredible educational resource. I have a migraine resources tab to help other people who have migraine and their caregivers um, through all of my experience. It's not professional medical advice, it's anecdotes. Um, And then I also continue to share my story and my journey, but I also, I do fun pieces as well. I just kind of write, I share, of my interior design and my artwork on there as well so it's it's grown <laughs> it, it is and uh, and i'm i'm very uh, surprised because it's it's actually it looks very professional like your, you. your your comments your pictures and everything looks really well done and it's not a small blog you have a few thousand subscribers from what i saw so th- <laughs> yes that means i've got that about two thousand people across a couple of platforms that um, go into that subscriber number. I probably have about about a hundred active people in addition to the email subscribers who interact with each post. But it's it's incredible with how much it has grown, and it also expands onto the mighty. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they're a chronic illness and disability mental health organization. Okay. It's a social media page, and so I'm a community leader there. And so some of my posts have been republished, and that has opened up an entirely new worldwide community of people. So it's it's grown. I never expected it from the first day going home. My first post was about what I call the lost day of just, you know, that feeling when you, you've just lost your day to the pain. That That was how it started, and now it's so much more. <laughs> It is. It is so much more, and and I see you have it divided in chapters. And uh, your your latest chapter seems very uplifting and very positive and very informative. So uh, so yeah, I invite anyone that wants to learn more to to visit your blog because it's it's extremely informative and very helpful. So thank you. That's great, Alex. Uh, what does the future hold for you now? What what are your future plans? Yeah. So um, I've got a few things in the works. Um, Right now, I did just move out on my own again mid-July. So I am in this process of kind of learning how to be independent again. I have to strictly adhere to my budget because disability payments are not (laughs) nothing to be jealous of for all the people who are jealous that I have payments for being sick. They're not much. And so I have to learn to work with that and also plan financially for the future. I am learning to cook again, so I've been relying heavily on HelloFresh, the meal delivery service, because it gives me new flavors, but it also, I don't have to go grocery shopping. That's my next challenge, is learning how to grocery shop again and not be overwhelmed. Um, So right now, that's kind of the now. Next, I'm hoping to develop a few ways and understand what my skills are and how I can apply them to either a work from home type of job or developing my own small business to kind of work within my condition and not over strain myself. So it's a process and I'm definitely taking it slow, listening to my body and still kind of focusing on learning rather than implementing things because I'm nowhere near ready to work and be consistent enough. So it's a process, but going through it every day. <laughs> Great. And uh, I see a lot of uh, a lot of ambition and a lot of uh, you have this spark about you. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do a follow up interview in a couple of months and you're probably the next 
Mrs. President of the United States because you're, you're going to take over the world with that attitude. So, so that's great. Yes, I would volunteer to take over that role, but I am a little too young. Um, <laughs> but we could change up the rules, make it interesting. <laughs> All right, Alex. Well, that concludes our interview. I want to thank you. And uh, I know this is going to reach many people and they are probably going to be uh, coming to you for, for answers, visiting your blog, probably visiting your social media. So, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate this opportunity and thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks. You as well, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.